sabemos que nosotros estamos entre ustedes y el almuerzo. So we're going to make it snappy, but fun, exciting. Hola, soy Alfredo, Ámbar, Eduardo, Marina, Henry. No sé, mis papás siempre me dijeron que había que presentar a la gente. Eh, vamos a hablar, today we're going to talk a little bit about work, uh, successful workplace and leadership development. Uh, Carla, thank you for los lentes. I see everything with a female perspective now. <laughs> the world is great. <laughs> um, we're going to do popcorn style, so we're going to try to get four perspectives on as many questions as possible. So our panelists will try to be very quick, brief. They're not going to try to give expansive answers. If you want to talk more, question their answers, follow up, please have them at El Almuerzo. So let's get going. This one goes to, to everybody. In your personal pathway, oh, let me explain. We're going to address this panel. We're going to go from the individual, and then we're going to open it up to ecosystem, macro, and then we're going to close back with individual. Okay? Make sense? Got it. So in your pathway to success, what experiences, development opportunities, or resources you want to call out that were important to propel your growth? Take it away. Anybody. Okay. Well, I can go first. Hello, I'm Marina, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I will go back to the way that I was raised. I think for many of us, um, we can think back to the experiences that we had as, as uh, kids and um, can highlight some things. And so I'll talk about my mom. My mom was a single mom of three girls. And so you can think about the hardships of trying to get food on the table on just one income. She often worked two or three jobs. Um, I shared with someone earlier that she sold um, items that she made herself in the street corner so that she could pay for a bilingual school for me growing up, which is how I learned English. And so what I learned from her is to lean into the work. You know, I learned that you raise your hand for every opportunity. You approach every opportunity as an opportunity to learn, to grow, um, and you don't shy away from hard work, right? So the rolling up your sleeves and just getting to work is something that has traveled with me in every career, and it's been really how I approach every job that I've been in, and I think it's really helped me learn, grow, and succeed. Gracias. Well, I'm the uh, proud son of two immigrants as well. My dad is from Mexico and my mother's from El Salvador. And um, they're all great, but I, I wish I could have had somebody early on in my life to the point that we've been making throughout this workshop is the impact that we can have on some young folks. Uh, they're not just interns to me, just so you know, they're part of my team and they're part of my family from the moment that anybody becomes part of our organization. But back to my parents, you know, I knew early on that the injustices and barriers they were facing was something that I wanted to address. So I quickly needed to figure out how to change or impact policy. Cada vez que mi papá me decía, diles que yo lo puedo hacer, um, he says that he could mow your lawn. Uh, dile que también le puedo arreglar, uh, you know, la puerta. Oh, now he's a welder, and right? <laughs> dile que, que yo sé dónde puede hacer sus impuestos, pero que me tiene que dar cinco dólares y yo lo llevo para allá. Now he's like an Uber driver, right? <laughs> what, what that taught me is that our family, our, our Latinos, we're, uh, have the entrepreneur spirit in us. It's very strong. And so everything from that moment on, since I was four or five years old, I knew that I needed to learn whatever my task was in front of me. I might not be the best, but I can tell you I'm going to try the hardest to be the best at that. So in my career, I've had to go from have no idea how to put together a budget. I can tell you I know how to put together a budget, right? I don't know how to lead an organization. I could tell you I know how to lead an organization now. I didn't know anything about marketing, so I just call it Fredo. <laughs> I learned a little bit, right? Okay. So that, well, to my on, point... On that, that note, we're going to yeah. cut you off. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Eduardo Ambar. Uh, buenos dias, or buenas tardes now. Uh, everyone, my name is Ambar. I use she, her, hers pronouns. And um, I think that for me, um, part of it was, I think there's a couple of things. So I think the first is as a Dominican, and an American. I was really grounded in my African, my Taino, my Spanish, and my Irish heritage. And so learning my histories and understanding where I come from was really a key place for me to start. Um, 
because I am a product of the colonized and the colonizer. And so understanding that allows me to really truly understand what my place is in this world and how I can make a difference and leverage the assets that I have and the privileges that I have to do better uh, for others. I think that the other thing was I have had incredible mentors along the way, so I stand on the shoulder of many. I had great opportunities to have people uh, show me the path and just literally hold my hand and take me with them uh, to places and spaces that otherwise I wouldn't have had access to. And the last thing that I'll say is that um, I have uh, leaned into every opportunity to, um, to be on boards, uh, to be on lots of boards and embrace every opportunity that I have to pay it forward. Those have been critical learning spaces for me, to be on boards and committees that are about things that are related but not always the same. Uh, it has been a huge part of my professional development. And I've always continued on this journey to really understand all of the isms that get in the way of centering the community voice. Oftentimes in our places and positions of privilege and power, we think we know better, but remembering that the answers are always in community is what I hold on to, always. Bravo. Eduardo, bring us home. Yeah, I just want to say, uh, so glad to be here today. Uh, maybe one of the things that really are truly you know, special to me is the fact that I spent time in my life to do a lot of work in the private and public sector. Uh, I'm leading the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce of Metropolitan St. Louis nowadays, and it's been a great honor to do that job. But before that, I was involved in politics for 19 years, helping to create a political party, helped to elect the governor, elect a couple of con congressmen and women, and also uh, working with civic organizations at national level. Before that, I was running organizations, running my own businesses, and in my previous chapter, working for large organizations. And now when I have time, I like to write books. So I'm publishing my third book, the first one about starting businesses, the second one was a political book, and the third one is about the pandemic, how life has changed forever. So this combination of different experiences put me in a position to look at different angles when we try to approach our issues and, and problems. Great, thank you. Thank you for those answers. I think that if you're Latino, you're an expert in diversity because if you like Dominican, Cuban, Puerto Rican, Mexican cuisine, you're an expert in diversity. <laughs> okay, um, we're gonna get to the uh, sin pelos en la lengua section of this panel now. Some of you know what that means. Um, Ambar, when we talk about, let's now open, we're gonna go to a broad aperture about leadership and leadership development. Let's, uh, let's, let's get to the real real on what are the things that are not working when we talk about leadership empowerment in, our commun in nuestra comunidad? What are the things that we need to like say, sin pelos en la lengua, this stuff needs rethinking? It's a great question. And uh, here's my sin pelos en la lengua <laughs> answer for you. Uh, no, it, so I have been doing uh, community engagement and education and social justice work over the past 20 years. And in spite of all of the signs, um, all of the research, uh, all of the data that shows that um, our outcomes are not where they need to be for students and even in college, uh, we keep doing the same things. We keep teaching in the same ways, we keep investing in the same kinds of uh, practices. We have an education industry uh, that has been around since the Industrial Revolution 400 years ago. And we are practicing it in exactly the same way. And we need to stop. We need to stop invent investing in the current practices and start looking at the more innovative practices which actually happen to be more indigenous ways of being and doing. <clears throat> so we need to go back in order to go forward, way back. Uh, so I would say that we uh, need to create, we need to stop uh, investing in the ways of educating our children that we have um, if we want to have uh, students and uh, people be able to in be able to be ready for the jobs of the future and I know that you've all been hearing a lot about education today but I'm going to put in another plug we do not know what jobs are going to be like even in 10 or 20 years 
So why are we educating students in college and in the K-12 and pre-K system in the same ways that are meant for today or even yesterday? It doesn't make sense. Instead of doing innovative practices around art, around coding, around team building, around critical thinking, instead of investing in, in how to, you know, innovative ways of protecting our environment, democracy, uh, preparing for a global economy, we're doing the same old, same old. So I would say we need to stop, and when we stop, when we say we're gonna stop investing in those things, then it creates this huge space for what next. Mm -hmm. And that's when our brains start to kind of work towards that. So if we want, the work of the future to be prepared and the workforce of the future to be prepared, we need to stop investing in education systems at the post-secondary level and in the K-12 spaces in the same ways that we are today. And that happens across, you know, I say this to folks here because I know that you're all in the public, nonprofit, and corporate sector, and we're all investing in those ways right now through our vote, through where we put our money, and through how we do our, our programs and our organizations. All of that needs to stop, and we need to make space for innovative, child-centered, critical thinking ways of doing work. Thank you for that. That's, that's brave. Uh, we have to embrace our futurists, right? We were, we, we've heard about 2060 and what the world's going to look like. I like to call them Calle 13. We're no longer visitors. We are residentes. We're going to own it. So. Thank you for that. Um, Henry, you run Latino Economic Div You know I was going to do Calle 13. You Dude, know was, I was going to do it. That was really good, actually. OK, you're welcome. There you go. Got to keep him awake. Lunch is waiting. Uh, Henry, you run, you're the president and CEO of Latino Economic Development Center, and you face daily challenges uh, with nuestra comunidad, uh, empresarios, entrepreneurs that want to follow the American dream, want to pursue the American dream, but have no idea, perhaps, of how to actually take the first step. You want to talk a little bit well, about that? I actually would say that we know how to take the first step. We're, we're still here, man. You know, <laughs> right. everybody was worried about, yes, is there businesses that uh, didn't make it through the pandemic? Uh, absolutely, and we need to acknowledge that. But we have a lot of businesses that have, and we need to acknowledge that, too the efforts and and i also believe that some folks that didn't make it they're going to come back yeah because you know what i heard from folks they would say henry yo puedo comenzar mi primer negocio sin ninguna ayuda de nadie like they know how to start a business again if they needed to and we should be proud of mm -hmm. that but i want to i want to bring it back to what amber said about the investments in, in organizations and people do, do you guys remember us uh, maybe you have a cousin older cousin or uncle or somebody that was like Te voy a dar tu domingo, you know, your allowance, pero te tienes que comprar unos zapatos. Well, oh, man, okay, so now, uh, now I have to buy something that he's telling me to buy. Or if you're a, a manager of an organization or, or corporation, it's like, hey, we want you to be innovative, but like, you, here's, you only, your budget is actually less than last year, but we need you to be innovative, right? That, I want to make sure that the foundation world and corporate world understand that if we're going to do anything different, we need to do things differently. Mm -hmm. And people are more innovative, not being put in a box, but being told, you know what, Henry, for LEDC, great job. Don't tell me great job and say, but I need you to spend $100,000, you know, in this particular sector. No, let me, let our board, let our volunteers, let our staff say this is how we're going to spend 100000 and this is how we're going to support our businesses so that they can thrive and, and be successful. General operations support, let us be innovative, don't put folks in a box. Yeah, and that's, that's you know, as a fellow nonprofit person, sometimes it's tough, right? Funders say, here's, here's your funding, but you have to do these seven things. Like, uh, those are not the seven things that are most urgent. So I, that dilemma is out there in nonprofit land. Um, let's go to Marina. Um, Marina, in your experience, uh, what are factors that make a successful workplace? Let's just start there, since we're at 3M. Yeah, so um, I believe that successful workplaces really recognize that employees are human first. Right, we think about even the title of, of um, the, co the organization that's partnering with us today, we are human. And I think when we take things to the most basic kind of human needs that everybody shares, whether we're Latinos, black, African-American, name the diverse demographic, 
we share some things in common that are basic needs that are requirements right, for us. And when I think about it in the context of the workplace, um, I think about three things, and so I've listed those out for you, but the first is connection to purpose. I think every human being wants to feel like what they're doing in this world matters. You know, so whatever that purpose is, um, I think making sure that organizations connect to the purpose in a really um, human way is really important. I think we all um, feel the need to belong, right? To be part of a community, to be part of, of a group of people that welcome us, that um, make us feel part of something, no matter what our diverse demographic may, may be, but that it is a place where, where we belong and that there is a community. And the third, I would say, is empowerment. You know, the, the idea that we are trusted um, to get our work done, that we have the tools, the resources that we need to make an impact, I think those three things are really basic kind of needs that unite everyone, connection to purpose, feeling like you belong, and being empowered. I think about um, kind of growing trends, and I reflect, you know, like everyone else, on what's happened in the last, you know, two, three years, right? Not just the pandemic, but all of the challenges that we've faced in our communities with all of the horrible things that have happened um, and continue to happen, the economic um, turmoil, you know, and the, the impending recession and all of these things. Um, I think about trends that workplaces really need to consider as we think about being successful. The first is um, flexibility. And we know that 3M is doing that really well, thinking about how do we continue to offer, offer people the flexibility to be able to manage all of the, the horrible things that happen in our communities, but the requirements of being there for our families, right, through all of these things. So flexibility, well-being has become quite the trend in organizations, not just 3M, but in my previous employers as well, really focusing on the fact that, again, we're human beings and we need that. We need to make sure we're taking care of ourselves before we can take care of others or do great things for the organizations in which we work. And the last is being appreciated and rewarded. We know that we are living in a world where there's a competition for talent, um, there's a competition for our attention, and so making sure that people feel like, again, what they do matters, but they're also appreciated and rewarded for what they bring into our organizations, I think are, are critical growing trends also. Thank you. Um, let's go to all. So let's go back to popcorn style. Um, let's talk about leadership um, rapidly. Let's do a rapid fire here. What are some skills or skill areas to focus on that would support the growth of our Latinos at the highest levels um, in, in the economic ecosystem? What are some of those fundamental skills that you say we have to get really excellent at if we're going to, uh, like Carla said, push Superman out of the hill and take it for ourselves. Let's talk about those skills. Yeah, can, Eduardo is ready to go. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. Uh, I just want to say that I think as Latinos and uh, Latinas, tenemos que trabajar juntos. We have to keep our ability to communicate and listen with uh, authenticity, right? That is so important. We have to keep our core message to ourselves, but also to those who work with us. So authenticity for me, it's incredible superpower. Uh, also, you know, listening with uh, empathy. If we can keep listening with empathy and looking at everybody with the lenses of inclusiveness, you know, equitable, equitable behavior, and also looking at people in a very accommodating way, I think is a great way to really put us ahead of the curve because we will understand what is coming next. So I think for me, if we can keep that going, as a Latina and Hispanic community, I think we're going to be stronger and stronger moving forward. Great. Yeah. Follow up, anybody? Yeah, I, I, I like to think of uh, every job I've ever, ever had since the first job I've ever had, I knew who my replacement was the very next day. I've always thought of, I need to know who's going to replace me internally and who's going to uh, replace me potentially externally. I always want to make sure that I know, hey, by the way, I'm about to leave my job, get, get ready, get ready. Mm -hmm. And that's really important to me. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, it's, it's always. 
I'll mention too, um, you know, going back to my previous answer around kind of the pandemic and where we find ourselves as a workplace, as a Latino community, um, as a Latinx community, I think two skills that we really need to get good at are one, um, navigating ambiguity. You know, I think about the uncertainty that we're all facing in lots of different ways. I think that's a skill, and I think that's something that can be developed through mentorship, through learning from others, through lots of different ways, and being most of more, more than anything, just being conscious of it. But navigating uncertainty, and then the second is resilience. And I think we've talked about this in lots of different ways. I think we've learned a lot, again, through all of the what's happened in the past few years. And we have to learn how to get up quickly, right? How to stand up once we get hit. What do we do to kind of rise back up and um, kind of keep moving forward? And I believe that's also a skill that can be developed. Great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tag this to the next question because I think I'm gonna declare that Amber is our provocateur uh, on the panel. So um, Hispanic representation is lacking at leadership level, including boards, other high visibility, high accountability, high trust positions. Can, can we start a conversation, a discussion here on what needs to change? How do we start to occupy those spaces more successfully, more consistently? I think um, we need to grab a chair and bring it to the table. That's a uh, part of it. Yes, please. I think that we are waiting to be invited in so many p cases, and we need to make sure that we are pushing our way through to get to the tables. I'm going to give you an example in philanthropy, which is where I am right now. Philanthropy has endowments of about $1.7 trillion. Say that number again. $1.7 trillion in the United States, mm -hmm. with a T. In 2019, about $371 billion were invested in grants only in our communities. In our communities, I mean every community, uh, locally and some globally. $89 billion of that was from private foundations, meaning corporate, family foundations, such as the one I work with. Do you know how much representation of Latinos are in those spaces? 4% on boards and 3% of CEOs in philanthropy are Latinos right now. It's a problem. Because when we are not at the table, then we do not get heard, our issues do not get addressed. And that's not just on the grant-making side, ensuring that grant dollars go to be invested in economic development, in education, in all of the things that we know are important, in gender-based violence, and all of the things that we know that are important for our communities. The endowment side, where the $1.7 trillion is, is invested, I think it's, uh, and you might know this, I think it's less than 3% 3, 3 is invested in the Latino community. The majority of those resources, which are loans and capital for businesses to start uh, their, uh, for entrepreneurs to start businesses of all kinds that build our economy and our wealth in our community, are predominantly invested in white communities. Surprised? No. But we need to do something about it, and we need to push our allies in these spaces to be doing something about it as well. And what does that look like? It looks like opening up spaces on boards for more Latinos and BIPOC communities as a whole to be part of these spaces and making sure that as the, the baby boomers and all of those that are stepping out um, retire, that we invest in more leadership for these spaces to come through. I'm giving you the philanthropy perspective, but I think this is true in corporate. It's true in nonprofit. And it's true in all spaces of leadership. So we need to be thinking about succession planning with intentionality and making sure that we're preparing folks. But we shouldn't be waiting for that. We should, make, we should be pushing our way through into these spaces as well. Any follow-ups? I'm just going to put a quick plug in that if you're looking for board experience, please see me. Um, we are recruiting. I'm the board chair for Latino Lead with Irma Marquez Trapero, and we are we have opportunities. So if you're looking to gain experience, that's how you start, right? You start with um, opportunities that avail are available in your area. That's great. I, I yeah. just want to mention that we have about 20. We represent about 20% of the U.S. population, right? 65 million, 70 million, 
And then when you look at the impact, I mean, the representation of Latino and Hispanics in business and uh, corporate, you know, boardrooms, it's less than 5%. So we have a problem, right? We have an issue. We have to face this issue. And for me, one of the ways of doing that is really looking at how can we raise the awareness level with Latinos and non-Latinos that we need to be more coherent, right? That is a gap in society. And with lack of business and political representation, our business do not scale up. So we have a pipeline problem. I mean, we, we have a lot of small businesses and then mid-size and then large organizations. But if we don't get the proper business and political representation, we're going to always hit a glass ceiling. And that is a big issue. Yeah, I, I would tie the, these answers to the previous panels where we were talking about the closing the gender gap, talking about the education gap. Obviously, follow the money. It should not be a surprise to us the number that Amber just dropped on that stage. And I forgot to mention the second point that is related to uh, we need better political representation in our districts, in our states, at federal agencies. I know that we still, we have done a lot of great work over the years, but we do need to do more. So maybe one of the things we want to do, we really want to get involved in politics. That's going to be a great way to change reality. That's why I'm so excited to be here because I see a lot of leaders, civic leaders, business leaders, political leaders. And if we do that and we have enough political representatives, we're going to change reality. Instead of having 5% yeah. of the procurement business contracts, we're going to have 15% one day, 20% one day. And then with you know, a larger budget, we're going to be able to do much more. So like Abuelita said, don't play small. Um, let's talk about entrepreneurship because it's a, it, I, I discovered it's a common theme here. I, all of you have that spirit, and I love it. So, um, Henry, I'm going to throw it to you, and, and we'll just continue to popcorn around. Um, how, how do we make better connections between corporate America and small business entrepreneurship? How do we make that, you know, um, those two ends of the business sector synergize, synchronize, collaborate? Should I start and then you go? Okay, uh, go, yeah, go ahead. I just want to say this. Uh, I think that is a really great opportunity to connect uh, corporate venture capital. We can start a new chapter there. Large organizations providing a lot of experience with institutional relations and also management systems, right? That's what large organizations do quite well. And then we have the startups that can really come up with pockets of innovation to address civic, business, and community you know, issues. And there is a pipeline to be built, but we have to build this new pipeline of access to capital using the metrics that work for minorities, right? The black community, the Latino community, uh, the LGBT community, the Asian community. We really have to build new metrics because we have a different mindset. The way we approach problems are different. So we cannot expect to succeed raising capital using the same mindset that was used for a different group of people. So I think we need to start having these conversations because if we have these conversations, large organizations and startups will be able to collaborate more and more. Great follow-up. Sorry, yeah. Henry. Yeah, it's, uh, it's just not, it's not no longer access to capital. I would say anybody can access capital for the most part now. It's about affordable patient capital for our community. Some of the small businesses can't afford the capital that you could access at this point. And yes, do we want to support someone to own their building? I absolutely want to do that. Do I want to make them be in debt for the next 30 years without creating any wealth for themselves because now you're paying the bank everything? That's not what I want to do. And so when I think when Eduardo talks about let's start thinking about different metrics or different ways to do work, Access to capital is one of the most important ways we need to start making sure that things change. To Amber's point, that trillion, we got to make sure that that thing comes with a zero to one percent interest mm -hmm. to our community. And it is very much doable. Amber has already done it where she is coming from. I know all the other foundations can do it too. Amber Marina, we're good? I don't think there's anything left. Okay, shameless plug for Mita. 
Uh, we believe in creating access to capital, so our underwriting practices are very different from what any Main Street bank would do. And in our case, we're uh, growing our capacity for lending to the size of the problem. We think about the lack of credit or what's called the credit deficit for black-owned businesses in this country is $9 billion, billion with a B, not T, billion. So look at the scale, the scale of the numbers that we're talking about here. So from my vantage point, when I say follow the money, follow the money, get the power. Follow the money, get the power. Because if we are in the positions of decision where that money is then dispersed, invested, and recycled, don't forget that business loans get paid back and they get recycled. They go right back to someone. Who is that someone? So the power of business lending in this country is huge. So uh, from our perspective, Vantage uh, to be here with a microphone and just that plug for me to we are scaling our lending capacity to the size of the problem um, Let's um, let's switch gears real quick um, As as we've all seen if you're a, if you're an HR practitioner, you're a chief people officer the world is changing as we're talking 2030 already looks different 2040 2060 very exciting people are talking all over about the gray tsunami How many have heard the gray tsunami? Everybody heard that term? No? Oh, okay. Well, the gray tsunami is the baby boomers are retiring. But after this morning's presentations, I think there's a Latino landslide coming. And I like that. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, as, the, as the workforce grows in diversity, as this mo Latino, I'm going to own it, Latino landslide is coming, um, how can corporate America be prepared to foster and develop that inclusive culture that we're going to need? Marina, you wanna take that one? Yeah, so I'll say, you know, I've been in HR for the majority of my career um, as an HR partner or a talent leader or in different spaces and most recently in the DNI space. And it is clear that we have a lot to do, right? We talk about it, we say it. Um, I've been at 3M for now three and a half months, not, not yet my four month anniversary. But even in my previous role, um, you know, it, it was very clear that we have to do a lot to step up our game. And I think events like this one are super duper helpful. Now, had I been longer at 3M, I would have invited a lot more people to come with me from talent acquisition or other groups. So I hope to do that in the future. I'm still learning names and getting to know me people. I haven't even met you, Sylvia, in person. So, um, so I have a lot to do. But I will say that as an organization, as um, corporations, we have to listen more often. We have to understand what are the, the cultural nuances, what are the needs of um, employees in diverse demographics, what do you care about? And that changes based on what is happening externally in communities. And so it's really important that that continuous listening to what people care about, what's important, how do we connect that to how we hire people, how we make this an attractive place for people to want to come and work, because this is about giving people access to jobs, yeah. right? Access to opportunities. And so we can't do that if we can't connect with people on what it is that they need and what they're looking for. So I think continuous listening and really understanding um, the nuances of how you show up in the workplace and then how do we connect how we develop and make opportunities available to you that's fantastic it, I mean it's it's a huge undertaking it, it's culture it's it's HR administration it's benefits right it's all the things that are about the human capital of, of corporate America so it's 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 and daunting. let me just say, yeah, we're not daunting. giving ourselves a pass though, right? Because just because it's complex doesn't mean we shy away. So I'll go back to my earlier comment. You know, one of the things that, or one of the reasons I think I was hired to do this job was because I do come with that spirit of roll up your sleeves, let's figure it out. And hopefully Alejandro has already heard me talk a little bit about this. Like there's some things that we need to fix. So we can't shy away from it as, as corporations just because it's complex and it's nuanced. Like we need to lean into the work. And so I think that's really important for companies to really step up their game it's inevitable that's great okay we're going to finish right back with a nice tight focus on the individual we're going to do a quick round we call this uh the elevator speech or the leadership mantra we have great leaders here on stage so i wanted to give them the opportunity to give us a few words that are their leadership core value core thought the thing that when you think about your own personal leadership brand what what brings it, uh, makes it happen for you. So whoever's the brave one, I'm looking at you, Henry, and bringing it this way, 
and we wrap it up, and then we get tortillas and mole poblano. <laughs> right? Is that really the, the lunch? That, uh, they showed a picture, so I thought that's what we are getting. <laughs> no, I mean, my, what I, what's got me to this point is that uh, yo, yo hago todo al cien, al cien por ciento. Like, if, you know, uh, I'm a husband, 100%. I'm a dad, 100%. When I was, you know, an educator in the classroom, I better be a, the best teacher that, that those students have because there's no other teacher. I was 100%. So I go 100% on everything I do. I'm not saying I do it right, but I give it my all. Great. And I learn from that. Beautiful. Marina. Um, mine, I'm going to read it. It's, uh, I am not a product of my circumstances. I am a product of my decisions. And that quote comes from Stephen Covey, and it's one that I go to time and again. Um, and the reason for that, and I think you're picking up on the theme, right? Um, we all have faced hardships in our life. And so I think about my single mom. I think about um, living below the poverty line for most of my life um, and how that's shaped me. And um, really stepping out and recognizing that those circumstances have also played a part, but so have my accomplishments, so have my hard work, so have all of the great things that um, I have to offer. And so I often go back to that to just remind me that even in those hardships, there's, um, there's learning, there's growth, and there's impact, so. I love that. Take your power, right? right. Yeah. Eduardo. Th there is a quote that I really appreciate. It's uh, leadership's not about uh, authority to get people to do things. Leadership is about bringing people together to get things done. And I think that's what we really can do as Latinos and Hispanics. We can bring people together to get things done. Beautiful. Amber, bring it home. All right. Um, I think that, you know, going with the theme uh, that we are all human, if we are all human, then we need to be centering each other's humanity. So I carry a few quotes, which I'll read. Uh, the first one is, nothing about us without us is for us, which is an African proverb. The second is, centering blackness doesn't leave anybody out. What it does is center the root causes that are killing everybody. And that is a quote by Angela Glover Blackwell from Policy Link. I think as Latinos, we have African and indigenous ancestry, and we need to honor and elevate it and be allies to um, the black community. It will build progress for us as well. And the last one is washing one's hands of the conflict between the powerful and the powerless means to side with the powerful not to be neutral. We need to be acting, not standing still. We need to use our voice and our action and our vote in order to move progress forward for our communities and other black, indigenous, and people of color. Uh, so always centering the voices of those at the margins um, is important because then everybody wins. So uh, the last thing is I try to lead with integrity and hire people that are smarter than me. Well, thank you to our panelists. Appreciate your answers and your time and your wisdom. Thank you for your patience. And we are. What about the, 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 the countries deal? Oh, uh, we have several countries here. We have El Salvador, Mexico, Puerto Rico, Brazil, and the Dominican Republic. No, here, sorry. And, we, and Guatemala right there. So. So let's see. Let's just do the quick game. Puerto Rico, say when. Aquí, Puerto Rico, bravo. Muy bien, Boricua. Okay. Ay, right, Puerto Rico. Y Boricua. Ya, yeah, Boricua. Brasil. Bravo. Bom dia, la samba do Brasil. República Dominicana. Ay, todo el mundo te conoce. <laughs> México y El Salvador. Bravo. Gracias. 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 Gracias.